Anyway, okay, welcome to the uh, tutorial number two on management and coordination. I'm actually quite surprised that so many people are here because management and coordination sounds so boring. <laughs> but, uh, but we're going to make sure that it's not very boring and it's very interesting, of course. It's, a, it's an essential part of what e-government is all about. Um, depends what you mean by it, of course, and I'm sure each of the speakers and I will also myself come in a little bit about what we mean by that. So, um, please come in, thank you. Uh, the first one, do I, do I have a uh, device that I can... Is it this one? Yeah. Okay. Well, everybody's talking about smart these days, so... Um, Smart governments, smart cities, management and coordination, making it smart. I'd like to put uh, this topic into a context first. What are the, the evolving roles of government or e-government? First of all, going back to basics in some ways, e-government should improve the efficiency of government. Uh, we're looking for savings. This is particularly critical now, of course, since the, the financial crisis, that many governments are now looking to e-government much more directly for saving money. Uh, that's always been the case, of course, but it's even more critical now. Where I live in Denmark, that's the only uh, strategy in town. If you can't save any money, don't think about e-government. Uh, that really is an important issue, and also in the UK. Uh, here, the user is seen as a taxpayer, somebody who gives their money to w the way government uh, works, and it's important that uh, we spend taxpayers' money wisely. Don't waste it. And there's, there's many examples of controversies around different countries about governments wasting taxpayers' money. Maybe not in your country, but certainly some of the countries I know, <laughs> that's the case. <coughs> so the dilemma for government is how to provide more for less in this context, because with the increasing number of social problems and social issues and all the other uh, issues we have with, with uh, ageing and, uh, and poverty and uh, exclusion, government needs to be solving some of these problems, but using less money to do that. The next main issue here is what we call effectiveness, searching for, for quality services, developing quality services, where the user is seen as a consumer of those services. Now, this has been the mantra in, in, in e-government over the last 10 years or so with new public management uh, philosophy uh, develop, developing um, uh, uh, e-government where the user is really seen as a consumer just like they are in the private sector uh, expecting good services from the service provider and very often there's been a, a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, interest in making sh governments act in many ways just like a, a private commercial provider of services and learning from that uh, how to do it best and trying to emulate the way that that's done in the private sector. But the, the final issue round which, which encompasses them all in many ways is the, word, is, is the, the concept of governance good governance, where we're trying to get good governance from the public sector and, and, and government generally, where the user is seen as a citizen and a voter. Um, and the dilemma is how to balance the different interests of all these different stakeholders in society. Now, the point for me showing that is that in, 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 one, in one way, government has to act just like any other organization and be efficient and effective. But the roles that the people who use government, the user, whether they're citizens or businesses, are multi multiple and varied, then it's not just like a commercial contract with a, a commercial provider. It's very much also other issues are involved in that, like the citizen as a voter, for example. So government is by nature very, very complex. It's by no means straightforward. And, and uh, I am personally uh, reject the idea that government can only think of itself as another service provider just like anyone else on the market which is a lot of the discussion has been along those lines in the last last 10 years or so so that's really for me part of the context let's move this out of the way uh, this quote i like very much from alan mather in the uk the e envoy when when the uk government was starting to really push e-government in the uh, the early noughties, as we call it. E-government e e isn't any different from government. It just might make it better, sooner, cheaper. And that, for me, is important to remember. Very often, e-government has been seen as something separate, an add-on. But really, it's, it's the only point of e-government is if it can improve the way government functions. 
and uh, I mean, I'm pre preaching to the converted here, of course, but these, it's, very oft it's important that sometimes we remember that, that E should not be seen as something separate. It should be contributing to the way government functions in each of these ways here. These are the, some of the issues I want to look at um, in the next 20, 25 minutes before we then come on to um, four other more in-depth case studies over the next two hours. I'm also going to give a, a small example of the UK, which, which I think is also quite interesting because they're going through some quite radical changes again. So, so what I'm trying to do is start really at the top with the strategy and the, and the vision and then see how some of the, the issues which arise from that when we try to implement those things, manage them and coordinate and coordinate them. It's clear, it's obviously important that we have a clear understanding and a vision and a strategy. <coughs> See, it's not a matter of just of technology, but about strong management, leadership and human cap cap capital. ICT is just a tool, an enabler. It's not a problem solver or a panacea, <coughs> uh, which sometimes it's often taken as. And many of the examples I've seen around the world of e-government are which technology-led. The people who determine what goes on are the technologists only, rather than the politicians or rather than the, the people who are, who are involved in service development and service rollout. But we do need people to understand the technology, obviously. Yeah? So this balancing act is quite, quite important and quite difficult. And, ha and of course, it's changing fast. And one of the big challenges of any organization, whether it's government or not, is actually keeping up with technological change because it's ch it is changing so fast. And maybe government shouldn't try to do that in the same way that the, the private sector should because it's, it is changing so fast. Because government needs, of course, to be agile and flexible and effective and efficient, just like the private sector. But government, as I've hinted at before, has another role. Government, for many people, is the only source of stability and continuity in, in the lives of uh, families and individuals, but also for the private sector, providing a stable environment for investment and a stable environment for rules and regulations. So government both has to be flexible and uh, adaptive, but it also has to provide stability and continuity. So again, it's a complex situation. So th th we should not just be driven by the technology, but by all means, let's make sure that we understand what the new technologies, developments, for example, social media, can do for government and see how they can improve the functionings of government. Clearly, uh, any e-government strategy is, must be based upon a long-term vision with objectives and a phased approach, setting targets. These are sort of standard project or strategic management approaches which are very, very important. I mean, I mention these because in many countries they don't do it, do it very well, actually, because um, for um, many and various reasons, but um, it's, wor it's worth reiterating these issues. They are very, very important because in its nature, implementing IT into the public sector, into government, is a long-term process because it involves, and I'll come on to that in a minute, changing organizations, changing the way people work. It's something that you can't do overnight. It needs top level and also medium level political commitment, clearly. The most successful places I've seen e-government being rolled out are where this takes place. Uh, the UK is a good example where Tony Blair, when he came into power in 97, set this as a priority and banged heads together and pushed down the decisions that this had to happen and also the resources. Okay? And that worked for maybe five years or so. It w went a bit wrong afterwards, and I'll come back to that later. But it's certainly important, particularly in the early stages, to have that top-level political commitment and also maybe the, the medium level to make sure that the middle managers, who are often the key, aren't a bottleneck. And middle management often is the bottleneck in implementing any changes in e-government. It's also important to see government within the wider, the bigger picture, as I've hinted at before, pu within the public uh, sector context as a whole, within government as a whole, but also in wider society. Why are we implementing e-government? We want a better economy. We want a more open democratic society. We want better support to excluded people and, and people in poverty, people who have, have problems. Although we must see e-government in that context. It's not just putting services online uh, and, 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 and like tax services or, or, or changing your driving license. It must, government must be seen in the wider context. It, the justification of e-government is that it does those things as well. We need to assess and manage risks 
and take some sensible risks. Government is often seen as being very risk averse, of course, as are many Western economies compared, for example, with the US. I don't know how true that is, but that's certainly, certainly the case. Having a proper understanding of how to assess and take risks in a government context, is, I think, is very, very important. But it's very, very difficult, of course, because people don't like taking risks because it's dangerous. Not just civil servants, but also politicians. And this is, this is one, particularly politicians, because the next election is just around the corner, for example. So how do we make government a long-term project if we don't un understand and grapple with some of these things? Understand your strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats, which is, again, standard. Uh, uh, important things to, to, to think about. Some of the things which are often forgotten is it's very important when you're uh, roll, planning and rolling out e-government to think about some quick wins. This is very important because it shows that the money you're, you're spending is being used wisely, it has some immediate impacts which the, the users, whether the citizens or businesses, but also the civil servants who are working with this and the politicians can see that there are some relatively quick benefits from the money and the effort they're putting into it rather than waiting, you know, three or four or five years. I've just talked about the fact that e-government is a long-term project, but getting quick wins can be extremely important, useful politically and also in terms of the morale and motivation of staff. At the European level, for example, the quick win is e-procurement. It's... it's it, I was going to say it's seen as easy to roll out. It is actually in some ways, but it's also quite difficult. But it, it, when it's done successfully, as it is being done in many countries in Europe and has been, it can actually uh, give you extremely good returns and, on, on money saved, both for the government itself, but also for the companies or the people 